Okay, uh, hello everyone. And before we get started, I need to make some announcements. So uh, first is if you're taking ACSL with Rich Code, then contest one will be starting soon. And we will be sending out contest information through your email, including the contest link. And then second of all, so if you're in elementary division, your contest will be on number systems. But if you are on every other division, then you will be doing number systems and recursion. And I will be sending, uh, yeah, Jay, that's because I don't have it on. But I will be sending, there's a YouTube link. This is a recap of all of our classes last time. So... So lesson one and two are number systems. Lesson five and six are recursion. And then lesson 10 is contest one review. Okay. And then, so today's topic is iteration or loops. So in so today we will be you'll be learning about what a uh, code structure of a loop and you're gonna do more Python comprehension. So, so for before we talk about like loops in Python, we need to talk about loops overall. A loop overall is just something you need to repeat over and over. There's two types of loops. There's a definite loop, which means you need to do it a certain amount of times. Or uh, indefinite loop, which is you can only do it, which you do it until something is false. And the and the reason why we use loops is the first reason is if it's indefinite loop, we will just have to continue. We'll have to paste uh, the same exact code over and over and over and over again, and we may not have enough times run enough times. Or we may have too many, and we would have to check if it's already happened or not. And if it's definite loop, let's say we want to run a hundred thousand iterations, and let's say each code, each time we run an iteration, that requires that requires let's say ten lines of code. So then your code would be one million lines long. Uh, just the same thing over and over and over and over again, which is horrible programming practice. So that's where loops come in. Instead of having to print, having to put the same code over and over and over and over again, we can just use a loop, print the same code once, and just tell Python how many times we need to do it. So Python has two types of loops. First time, first one is a for loop. And second time is a while loop. So the for loop basically is your definite loop. So this first, this thing can, uh, one way you can use this is to, go through each item in a sequence, such as in a list or tuple, and iterate through it, as long as iterable, iterate, iterable. Like an int is not inter iterable, but let's say a string is, since each iteration, each part of the iteration would be just a character. So if we were to, let's say, iterate, let's say we have integer list is one, two, three, four, five. And since this is a list, it is iterable iteratable. So then we can use the for loop. And we can just print out a loop. And one thing to note is that, so in order to declare a for loop, we need of an iterate, iterable thing, then we need the following syntax. We have for and then we need a variable name. And then we need in. 
and then the other thing we want to iterate through. And then whatever we do, each time we iterate through the list, it'll be pointing to a different element in the thing. So first time we go through one, second time we go to two, third time we go to three, fourth time we go to four, fifth time we go to five. So if we were to run the code, we would do four number in integer list, we would print number and it would go to one and then two and then three and then four and then five. And then if we want now, if we were to try and call this number, let's say outside after, let's say like print number. Okay. Oops. In, in if you ran the code, if you ran this in un, any no, like Python IDE or something other than other than on Jupyter Notebook, you will get an error if number was never defined before. Since If since number is only accessible inside this loop. So let's say if we were to call number outside of loop, it would normally give us an error. So keep that in mind. If you were to put since Python's telling you if you're in a what in a loop or whichever loop you're in is based on indentation, make sure you have the correct indentation. So does anyone have any questions on how to do a for loop, a basic for loop given a list? Okay, if not, we'll go over another example. So if we have words equals cat, tiger, dragon. And so to declare this list this time, we can use four and then we can do W or whatever we wanted, even an underscore is allowed, as long as it is not a keyword. And then in, is a keyword so we cannot use in again as the variable and then in words which is our list and then we will print w and then length of w so we'll print cat and the length of cat is three characters long so it'll print three and then we would print tiger next and that is length five and then dragon, which has length six. And then if we say we want to go through a string instead, like here, like sentences equals hello world, I love Python. It's, it would just iterate through your string. It would if you were to use a for loop on it, then if we do four C in sentences, it would just print out one character at a time. 
I seen it would predict hello space world period space I space love space python dot. And then let's say, since I said, if, if you want it that to go something over a definite set of times, let's say you want to just go from one to five or zero to four, or let's say four to 10. We, do, we can, instead of doing four I in, and then a variable, we can use the range function. The range function, if, if we're just given range of let's say, n here. It will go to 0 to n minus 1. And if we were to go given a lower bound and an upper bound, so if it was n m, then it will go to from m n to m minus 1. So if, for example, if we wanted to 4i in range 5, if we print i in every time in the loop, we would get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 would be excluded since it is out, technically outside of the range. So if you one thing you can notice is that the endpoint is never part of this generated sequence. It generates 10 values, or if you did range 10, or if you get five values, if did range of five, but it starts at zero, or if not specified. So it will do zero through nine, which is 10 values by itself. And you can further specify range by putting another a third thing in the parenthesis, and that is the jump or the increment. And the jump basically means instead of going from one to two, if let's say the jump was three, we'll go from one to four instead. The two and three are skipped. And then after four, we will go to seven and then 10 and so on if we were to start at one. So for example, if we did range of zero to 10, we jump of three, we would get zero, three, six, nine. And we would not get more. We would not get more until, we would not go like past nine because nine plus three is 12 and 12 is greater than 10. And if we want to traverse backwards, like from a, if, if we have range of A, B, of A, B, where A is greater than B, by default definition of a loop, if you do not specify a jump, say we did here. It would automatically just give you nothing since this is great. The first one's greater than the second and you start from the first one and you keep, and before, after you take the value, see if it's less than or less than the second one, except it's the first value 10 is less than the second one. So it excludes it. But if we were to add a jump, and the jump was negative, like in this case where it ranges of negative 10 to negative 100 with negative 30, then Python would actually check, since this jump is negative, it means that we're going, it's basically essentially the same thing as going from 10 to 100 with jump 30 instead. And then it would go backwards, so negative 10, then negative 40, and then negative 70. And 
So there's another way to traverse a, a list, and we can use the instead use the method len, len of a list to help us. For example, if we wanted an index of a thing. So instead of getting like the element directly, we just wanted the index. Since getting the element directly and changing it will not change the base list, but if we've changed the list at that index, we could change the list. Then we could do for i in range, and then in parentheses put length of the list. And in doing so, instead of getting, let's say in our example, where fruits is apple, banana, cherry, and we're doing the four iron range length of fruits, we would, instead of getting apple, so instead of getting apple first, so instead of getting this first, and then this, and then this, instead of getting apple first, then banana, and then cherry, instead we'll get zero, one, two, and this would be useful since we can then change the zero. Let's say we we can then change the zeroth index. We can then change the zeroth index to to let's say orange or something, and but if we changed it for i in, and then we just did fruits. We if we try to change apple to orange. We would change it, but in the base, in the fruits list, it would still be apple. And then there's also one other key thing is the object returned by range. Since it's a certain amount of numbers, usually Let's say in normal cases, just what if you just did one number of n, it would just be n numbers. So it acts like a list, but it isn't. And thus, it saves you memory size. And on but then also printing it would only get one element at a time. So there's a slight trade-off. And then if you wanted to get both the index and the value of the index at the same time, without having to call the index of the list or the index of the tuple, we can use the enumeration, enumerate method or a new, sorry, enumerate object. So as usual, it must be iterable. And where we have, let's say in this case, my list, which is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And we can do, so enumerate will return two values. It will return the index and whatever the value is of that index. So that's why we have declared two values here. And we can do for index val in enumerate of my list. If we printed index comma value to join them together, and we just get the zero index is 10, the first index is 20, the second index is 30, the third index is 40, the fourth index is 50, and so on. And this is mostly useful, let's say, when you have, let's say, like a really long list where you have, let's say, a list called the very, very, very long list equals one, two, three, four, five. And in the very, very, very long list in here. Instead of having to type out the very, very, very long list I, we can just type val instead, and that would save us time. And then one other thing we need to know is that when we have 
let's say we want them to find in a list a certain number. Let's say we had one, two, three, four, five, and we were looking for the number three. And so we need to figure out, we need a way to exit the loop after we found three. And that is where the break statement happens. So after, sorry, that's where the break statement is used, where it can terminate a loop prematurely. But it also only terminates the innermost loop you are in. It, if you had multiple layers of loops, you would, as in like 4A, and then blah, 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 and then 4B inside. If you did break inside the B loop, it would only terminate the B loop and the outside loops would still run. And basically what it does is after something is true, we terminate the loop and everything after it is canceled. So for example, in this case, numbers is one, two, three, four, five. And we need, if we find num is equal to three, we'll break the loop. And as we as seen, we will break the loop and we will not go to four to five. And then another way, this is also useful in case, let's say we had to find, there were multiple instances of an element and we wanted to return the first. If we did not ever break the loop, let's say it was, Say it was the same nums equals one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. And we wanted the first instance of the number four. And let's say we had an integer to store the instance of it. First, no, first four equals negative one. We had an instance to store it. If we did not break it, let's say if for if num equals to four, sorry. First four equals num. Sorry, uh in IDX battle in enumerate. So let's say we did this and we did not break after. What would first four equal to after the end of the loop? Would first four equal to after we exited this loop? Okay, anyone else have an answer? Okay, Michael, that is incorrect. Wait, oops, sorry. Okay. And this first four, it would be five. So 
Let us go through what happens in the loop. First, we look at, so index is zero, value is one. And does, is one equal to four? No. So then IDX first four is still negative one. And then it's one, two, negative one, one, two, three, negative one, three, four, and this should be three now, since we found a value that is equal to four. It, and if this would be the first index of four, but then since we do not break, we will continue through the end of the end of nums. So we have four, five, and that is still three, and then five, four, and this just changed to five. Your IDX. So as, as we see, what we're looking for is the number three, but what we get is the number five. And that's one of the main reasons why you need a break loop, break, which all, the other reason is it improves the speed of your code. As you do not want your code to run for hours, let's say doing this instead of maybe taking minutes, which is why in here we have to have a break. And if we do add a break here to tell them that we have found it, then it would turn instead to three. Okay, and then the other keyword we need is The sorry, other keyword we need we can use is the continue. Now, what the continue does is it just jumps to the next iteration of the loop. So let's say we had the numbers is one, two, three, four, five. And if we have a continue, if num is equal to three, it will skip over everything after that iteration of the innermost loop that it is in. And if we run it, we can see that it, it skips the number three. So let's say, and one reason why you might want to use the continues is let's say you have, let's say you're making a round robin tournament where everyone plays each other once and you need to simulate every match, except in order to do that, you need to run all your things on one axis and all your things on another, all the same players on another axis. And we want to skip all the instances where the same player is playing itself. And thus, if we if we check that, we can just continue instead of having the code to simulate all of it. And then, and then at the end, see if the two numbers are, if the two players are the same and then not ex include the answer if so. And that would save us time. Another reason why is it could throw off your code. Like if you know, we have something that we want, we need something that is greater than or equal to zero. If this one instance, it is negative. So let's say it's negative five. Then we can continue if it is negative five and, and keep continuing until it is greater than or equal to zero. And thus prevent errors in our code as well. So does anyone have any questions about what break or continue does?
Okay. And then in Python, there is an else statement for a for for a for loop. It does not make that much sense, but there is an else statement. So it only the else statement only runs if the entire loop is executed and it has never been broken. So if the basically if the loop is never sorry, if the loop is never broken, so then it else blocks executes. But the moment the loop sees a break and breaks, the else block is also skipped. And this would be, this is useful if we wanted to see if a loop ran with or without interruption. Like if, it, if, if else runs, then we know that it has never been interrupted before. But if else doesn't run, then we know it must have been interrupted. And the other loop, as mentioned earlier, is the while loop. And what the while loop does is it executes a block of code as long as something is true. And it's useful as you may need to, you might not know beforehand how many times you need to repeat an action. For example, you just have a database and you just search through a database and process every single query. Except the database may be increasing in size as you're querying it. So that is why you would use a while, while loops as the for loop can you can only set a certain size and would not be working for sorry. You for loop you can either only set a certain okay so sorry about that uh that would be a reason why you would use a while loop as you do not know how many times and you need to run the query to process the data or let's say you need to just check while the weather is sunny outside is sunny outside and you can do query with that instead. And for loop, you would have to ch just you have to just have to run it on for zero into infinity. And break it while after you have something has happened. And that is just the same thing as using a while loop. So but basically for a while loop, you just do while and then a Boolean statement. And every time it goes through a loop, it checks if the condition is true. And if it is true, then whatever you put in the body runs. But the moment it is false, it does not matter if it becomes true again and later in the future, it's, it moves on from the loop. So let's say we had count is one, count to less than equal to five, and we can just do count. And we're going to print out count and then increase it by one. And we'll print out one, two, three, four, five. And after the end of the fifth loop, we will have count equals six. And six, six is less than equal to five. Sorry, six is not less than equal to five. We will then terminate the loop. And then using break and continue in a while loop is the same thing as using break or continue in a for loop. Break terminates the while loop. And continue just skips with the iteration of the while loop.
And now there is one issue with the infinite while loop. It, sorry, there is one issue with the while loop and it's if it runs indefinitely. So let's say so in no so num equals one. While num is not equal to is not equal to six. Num plus equals two and print num. So what happens if I were to run this code? No, I'm this part. Now, oh, okay, sorry. That's I'm have a habit from other programming. Okay, after I remove the curly brackets, what happens? Yeah, J, that is correct. The number, if we were to run it, it would just start increasing forever. And eventually, I, it, so that this is especially when you need a break. It, J, it would not crash, crash the device. But it will, it will run forever. And this is why you use a break statement. And the break statement is if we have a while true or while something that can never happen, then your code will never terminate. And whatever you put after it will never actually happen. And if, unless you did Unless you did a break statement, your code would just get stuck there. But if you did have a break statement, you would have a way to escape it, escape the loop, and print goodbye. Okay, uh, Chiao, if you did while false, it would just never run. Since if you do while false, is false and is false true? No. So if you did while false, then it would just never run the first iteration of the loop. And then if you wanted, there is another key statement. So it's the pass keyword. So in order for you to do some, most in Python syntax, there is some places where you are required to put a line, an indented line before exiting. Like here, like while true, you're into, in, in, required to put something here. And that is where you put pass. And the pass statement, all it, it does absolutely nothing. And that's, it's why it's used for syntax, but you don't want your program to do anything. Okay, so does anyone have any questions about a while loop?
Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, if not on while loop, why we need a infinite loop? Why we what the dangers of an infinite loop are what passed us? Okay, so before we move on to some more exercises. Before before we move on to more exercises, a loop does not have to be one dimensional. If if it's, we can have a while tr true and then inside it a while true and then while true, while true. In the pass, and what this does is it just runs forever until you keyboard interrupt. And this is also legal in Python. You can have as many loops as you want. And you can put as many loops as you want stacked on top of each other. Just recognize that that increases the likelihood of an infinite loop and also makes your code a lot slower. Okay, so first question, first exercise. So, We have a list of numbers and we need to use a for loop and print their squares. So how would we do that? What would be the first step to Iterating through a list of numbers and printing their squares. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and then what would the next step be? Yeah, okay, that's correct. And if we were run it, you will get the correct thing. Okay, that's good. You guys got the first one. Okay, second one is we need to iterate through a string and print each character. And Jeremy, you would be correct. Good job. Okay. 
Okay, uh, I'm going to do a slightly harder problem. So we have a while loop and we need to count backwards. So let's say we have num equals 200 and we need to count backwards, take two steps at a time, two steps at a time backwards until num is four to zero. Yeah, that would be correct. And we would print down all the way to zero and start from 200. So Jeremy, good job. Okay, and then one more question. So, now we need to enumerate through a loop backwards. Enumerate through, sorry, enumerate through a list backwards. Okay, first, let's just enumerate through a list before we make the back add the backwards part. So what, how would we enumerate the Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, Jeremy, that is not how you do it. So enumeration requires four, two numbers, two variables, A, B, and enumerate a list directly. And then we can just access A and B. So let's say print A, B. And that's how we would enumerate it. If we did what you did. We will get a absolutely nothing would happen since we aren't printing anything out. And and that just to enumerate nums just returns to vari two variables for each time we called it. And the issue is we do nothing with those two variables and thus nothing will be printed. Okay, so now how do we enumerate a list backwards? Yep, that's correct. Good job, Jeremy. So in order to enumerate through a list backwards, we can just reverse the list. And that would go backwards. Okay. 
actually there is a slight issue with this method is we see that this is 0 10 we want 10, 9 10 to 9 10 8 9 7 8 and so on we want the indexes and things to be the same and just print them out in the other order how would we do that Okay, Daniel, you that your solution is mostly correct. We just need to enumerate instead. Hey, does anyone else have any other ideas? Okay, uh, if not, the, this problem is hard, I will admit. So Jeremy was on the right track. We do need to do list.reverse first. And the issue we have gotten with that is we will get 0, 10, 1, 9, 2, 8, and so on. So in order to do that, we can just do list dot then list minus a and we can just fix the indexes like that and we will get this no okay and in that way we would just basically go through list backwards while keeping the indexes and everything the same and then after we can just reverse the list again and we will get and this will be the same, and we will have enumerated through it backwards. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? Okay, uh, if not, just a reminder that ACSL Contest 1 is starting very soon, and you will be emailed a contest link from HackerRink. And so uh, if your elementary division only covers number systems, but other divisions cover number systems and recursion.
And so, and then so, I, so I have just set a YouTube link in the chat where number where it has multiple lessons put together from our AC from Richko's ACSL class. And so lesson one and two are part of the number system, are covering number systems. Lesson five and six cover recursion. And lesson 10 is just a review of last year's contest one. Okay, if people do not have any questions, then you are free to go.